When I was a little kid, I loved to play with blocks. And I remember the pleasure of discovering that two of the square blocks were the same size as one rectangular block, and that two rectangular blocks were the same size as one big block. And this is all pre-kindergarten, but that was the moment when I believe I was learning arithmetic, when I was learning that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and maybe even the 2 times 2 equals 4. Now, I would never argue that at, age f that at the point at which I did that, you could have given, put me, sat me down with a piece of paper and said, with the words 2 plus 2 equals x, and had me fill that out. I couldn't. But I was building up the mental model of numerical relationships that I would then learn formally in school later. But the critical thing was I got there by playing. There's a value to writing 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's shorthand. It's a good symbol system. But it's not how we actually think about numbers. You don't need, same, same thing with words on paper. Words on paper are really valuable. Reading is really great. What do we do when we read? We think about ideas. So the last thing you need to do in a game is just give people the same symbol system that they use in school. Give them interesting ways of thinking about stuff. It, it is part of our nature to play and it is part of our nature to rise to challenges when presented to us if those challenges are interesting. They don't have to be uh, meaningful in the way that um, uh, religion or philosophy is meaningful. But, they, but they're challenging and they're interesting. And so we, we rise to those challenges. And that means that we as designers, if we put interesting challenges in front of people, I'd argue we can get them to think about things and do things that they might not otherwise have an opportunity to think about or do. I like to characterize it in terms of four freedoms. First, the ex freedom to experiment. The blocks. I was clearly no one said, this is what you do with blocks. You build these structures. Um, you see a lot of play nowadays where that happens, where you, get, you buy the Lego Star Wars uh, TIE fighter and all you can build is a TIE fighter, as opposed to an open box of Lego where you can build anything you want. Well, anyway, so I had the freedom to experiment. Um, related to that is the freedom to fail. When you, build, when you play with stuff, things don't always work. That's got to be part of the game. Imagine a kid building a block tower with a parent standing behind him saying, OK, that's a nice tower, but whatever you do, don't let that tower fall down. Think about how, cons how uncomfortable that play would become if the child was worried about failing. Or we can, build a, we can build a sand castle at the beach, but don't build it close enough to the water because it might get washed away. I mean, that's part of the fun, right? Failure is part of the game, part of play. Freedom to try on identities. Uh, think about your own play when, you're play when you were little, when you were young, and you played with dolls or stuffed animals, and you were acting out all the different people you knew and the, the kinds of roles you, you encounter in life. Parents, children, authority figures, uh, bullies. You played out all those different roles when you were a kid. You're trying them all on. You're trying to see what it feels like to be all the different things you might be in life. That's a critical part of play. Finally, freedom of effort. It's really important when you're playing that no one tells you you've got to play hard right now. In fact, when you're playing, sometimes you play hard, sometimes you play in a relaxed way. That's entirely up to the player. The minute someone says, OK, get going, get to work, it stops being play. So those are all critical. And, and it's critical because I, the reason I mention this is because when you start thinking about games, it's easy to forget all that fact. The, f the four freedoms of play are really the four freedoms of learning. Of l learning is about experimenting. It's about freedom to fail. It's about thinking about yourself in different roles. And learning is sort of self-directed and effort, you know, your effort is going to change. But compare that to school for a minute. Um, I know I'm being a little subversive here, but stay with me. Um, how often are you allowed to fail in school? However, how often are you ever encouraged to, uh, to make use of your failures in school? Or to even learn from your failures? And certainly, and experimenting in school, usually, uh, how many science labs actually ask you to really experiment? I mean, most science labs, you sit there and you do the list in the order that is, and, and if you don't get the result that you think the teacher wanted, maybe you fake it, maybe. Because the idea that you could learn from the failed experiment, you know. And forget about identities, right? You know, even though you're not, you're not allowed to come in one day and say, I feel like being this person. And you're certainly not allowed to, there's certainly no allowance for the fact that one day you feel like working hard and the next day you don't. I don't want you to think about how can I replicate school in a game.
not that there aren't lots of really good things in school, but I think school, the way you experience it on a day-to-day -day basis, is not what you want to replicate in a game. There's lots of things out there called learning games. Um, but I would argue that most of them aren't playful, and therefore most of them aren't learning.